So this is the intensity as a function of A in the 2D Brillouin zone and omega of the initial state from which you pull the electron out measured with respect to the chemical direction. It has three pieces. The first piece is purely kinematical and we won't focus much on it, but it's actually very important for the experimentalist. You can use selection rules to decide that you are actually photoemitting electrons from uh, orbital which is dx squared minus y squared symmetry, so everything that I was telling you is, is actually experimentally verified. You can use incident photon energy dependence in the matrix element to resonantly enhance things. But the reason why I'm not going to focus on it, it doesn't have any significant temperature or frequency dependence. The many body physics is an opposite. Then there is the Fermi function. Okay, since I'm measuring energies with respect to the chemical potential, that's what it looks like. That's it here. And then there is the object that we did talk about earlier, which is the spectral function. So in elementary terms, why do I get a Fermi function times a spectral function? And the answer is, I can only take out of the solid that which is already present. Right? So by multiplying by the Fermi function, I'm basically looking at negative energies occupy part of the spectral function. This can be made very precise using Lehmann representations, but let me not get that. I think the intuitive idea is right here. So here is the uh, one electron spectral function, which as I already told you, is the probability density of making a single particle excitation given a momentum k and an energy omega. So uh, this as I said, is related to the Green's function. So in a non-interacting system, the Green's function would just have been only 1 over omega minus epsilon k. All the effects of interactions are buried into this function, which is called the self-energy. Okay? The self-energy has a real part and a imaginary part. And you know they are all related to chromostronic and the usual analytic conditions. What sigma prime, the real part of the self-energy does, is to renormalize the dispersion. As you can see, it's going to modify epsilon k, as it were. And what the imaginary part does here, as you can see, is to give things widths. So this is going to be related to the scattering rate, or the inverse lifetime of the state that you're studying inside the material. Excuse me. OK. so. If I take the formulas on the previous page, G, stick in sigma prime plus I sigma double prime, take its imaginary part, uh, then you find the following formula which is given at the top. So you can see that this looks like if, for instance, you were ignoring all k and omega dependencies, which is not true at all, this would look kind of like a Lorentzian, okay, with a width which is set by the imaginary part and a shift of the dispersion which is set by the real part. That's not a bad way of thinking about what the data are going to look like. And here I show data from the Brookhaven group. <coughs> and what you can do is, okay, so here's photoemission data. Here is energy omega measured with zero, which is the chemical potential. Okay, and this is momentum going along a certain cut in the Brilma zone, which is shown in this inset. And false color plots, which is the only way to get your papers into the glossies. <laughs> uh, actually, you don't learn much from them, but it's a good way to quickly communicate something. You really have to look at cuts to see what's going on. Well, let me just show you that anyway. It's very broad down here, then it sharpens up here, and it crosses the chemical conditions. Okay? And so you can cut this in various ways, and maybe Dan will talk more about NBC and NBCs. But you can see that by analyzing this data in various ways, Either using this card, you see a fairly symmetric line shape, or using that card, you see a fairly asymmetric line shape. You can analyze these line shapes to get at sigma prime, sigma double. Now, one uh, thing which is worth telling here is, uh, the experiment is not this, but theory should think about why this is true. Uh, the two major experiments uh, in ITC are both very surface sensitive. That STM should be scanning tunnel microscopy should be surface sensitive is obvious. I'll let you figure out why his angle result photo emission is so surface sensitive. And you should figure this out before Dan's talk because he'll probably tell you why. Uh, and they are. And that's why the bulk of the data will not be on all the high PC superconductors, but primarily on this one 2212 and 2201, because these have a certain feature in the crystal structure that they cleave very well. 
And so if somebody says, yttrium, barium, copper oxide, where's the r -plus data? The answer is, there is very little. So what can we learn from r -plus? Okay, by looking at the dispersion. This is energy versus momentum, so it's a dispersion. Okay, you can find the Fermi velocity, it's just the slope of the slide. By looking at the spectral function at zero energy, at the chemical potential, where is the intensity the highest? You could learn about the Fermi surface. And then you can analyze things in greater detail to understand sigma prime, sigma double prime. And as I show you, this will be very important to look at momentum result gaps. How does this Fermi surface gap out the superconducting gap in the pseudo? Okay, so now we are ready to discuss the phase diagram, the interesting phases, the conducting phases of growth mount insulators. So we're roughly halfway to this lecture. Any questions? So in our case, how do you distinguish pseudo gap and superconducting gap? Okay, so all discussion of the pseudo gap will happen tomorrow. So I will postpone all uh, discussion of that. Okay? Uh, Let's just discuss things which are better understood first. Right? Because I think it's a very bad idea to talk about the confusions in people's mind before you have said that which is settled. So. Sorry, that yes, um, please. Uh, are there any experiments confirming that the interesting things happen on the copper oxide planes? Yes. So for instance, uh, uh, as I said, so let's many, many, but so STM of course looks it's atomically dissolved, so you can see the power side planes with your naked eye. You know. uh, but if you look at photo emission, for instance, okay, you see all the things that I'm about to show you, Fermi surfaces, line widths, gaps. How do I know it's all happening on this uh, copper oxide plane? Because by changing the polarization of the incident light on this, I'd be happy to tell you in more detail uh, after, afterwards. You can convince yourself that the selection rules of the orbital from which you are ejecting the electron has the symmetry of a dx squared minus y squared orbital centered around the copper side. So there are many, many ways you can convince yourself that all this is happening. Okay? Other questions? Yes, please. Um, so when you change the chemical components, so you said that you, you might have electron doping or photo doping. Mm -hmm. Are there any way to verify that statement? Because the electron might go to somewhere like vacancy or something. Yeah, it's a, it's a complicated story. Uh, one way to verify it is uh, go sufficiently far, put lots of holes, and then measure the Fermi surface, its volume, and say, yes, I have a hole doping. But in the middle, that can be pretty dangerous. Uh, there are actually other ways to do it too. Um, so, so, did, so one of the ways in which people traditionally decide whether I have electron-like carriers or hole-like carriers is look at something like the sign of the Hall coefficient, right? So why don't I say just do that? Or the sign of some other transport frequency vector. The answer is that the Hall coefficient is temperature dependent and often changes sign on you as you're measuring it. So it's not so easy to understand that in a strongly correlated material. But there are actually other ways of checking it too. So I don't have the slides on this and this, maybe I can include it in a later talk. Um, so if you look at tunneling spectra, STM spectra, but other tunneling spectra, they also show a very marked uh, asymmetry between what you see at positive biases and negative biases. And it's very easy to understand that in terms of a whole dope modern simulator. But yeah, so there are, there are many, uh, I think maybe each one of them you may not have believed, but taken together you say this is a whole dope material. Okay. okay. Other questions? Okay, so here goes. So, what I should do logically is I talk to the Mark insulator. So I should put in a few holes and see what's going to happen. But actually, this is a very messy region, so I want to postpone that. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put lots of holes and go right here to start in what I think is the most uh, conventional region. Let's start working our way back towards the Mark insulator. Okay?
That's the plan. So, over the two grids look like the liquids. So probably the first hints came from transport. Now, I don't know how much you guys are used to looking at transport, but if you see a T squared resistivity, uh, you declare that electron-electron interactions of the conventional sort are at uh, work. And it's not quite T squared, but it's almost there. At least that was the first thing. Then came some photo emission. Sorry, um, below about 120 Kelvin. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. But anyway, uh, that's iffy. But it's looking more conventional. Then you look at RPS and various overdue materials. Uh, and you actually see a large Fermi surface. Okay? And here you can see the. See, this is a nice picture which shows you a cut at the Fermi surface when you're looking at energy equals zero at the chemical potential. You see two Fermi surfaces because this one, two, two, one, two has two copper oxygen uh, slayers per unit cell, so it's a bilayer material. And you see the two bands and so on. Okay, but actually the most convincing evidence that this is a Fermi liquid comes from quantum oscillations. Okay, um, we see a large Luttinger count Fermi surface with one plus x plus. So since quantum oscillations play a minor role here, only in showing that this is a, a Fermi liquid, but they're going to play a very major role in my lecture tomorrow. Okay? So let me remind those of you who don't know what quantum oscillations are, what they are. I think Greg Bobinger is the only one, and maybe uh, Oscar might say something about uh, quantum oscillations later. But let me give you a baby version of what quantum oscillations are. So let's take the simplest, most trivial example where you can work out everything explicitly. You've never seen it before. So let's take the exactly solved problem of free electrons in two dimensions. We all know that that gives rise to a density of states which has lambda levels. Okay? So huge spikes in the density of states separated by h bar omega c. Omega c is the cyclotron frequency set by the magnetic field. Now let's imagine parking our Fermi energy here, determined by some fixed number of particles that we have. And imagine changing the magnetic field. As you change the magnetic field, uh, omega c will change on you. Okay, increase of, uh, the magnetic field, omega c increases. Lambda levels pop through the Fermi energy as you are tuning your magnetic field, right? And they go by boom, 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 boom. You can count them. And so you get a peak in the density of states when the Fermi energy precisely uh, equals n plus one half h bar omega c. This happens at a one over h value. The n is this label, and our level index, uh, with this formula. And now you can see that this is going to be periodic in 1 over h, because 1 over hn and 1 over hn plus 1, uh, if you look at the difference, the period is just given here. So here are some fundamental constants. And pi kf squared is the area of your Fermi surface. It is, right? So you can see in this very trivial two-dimensional example that the periodicity of the density of states in one over field okay, gives you a frequency which is a direct measure of the Fermi surface area up to fundamental constants. So frequency is universal constants times the Fermi surface area, which in this case turns out to be pi k s squared. So why did I do this very trivial example? Because this formula in red actually turns out to be correct, not just for this trivial example, but also for any Fermi liquid in two or three dimensions with an arbitrary uh, base-based dispersion. Okay. And so this goes back to classic work of Ansaldar and Lifshitz and Kosovich. Yeah, this, this assume, sorry, yes. uh, this is this is going to be an, an arbitrarily shaped Fermi surface? Okay, so it can be an arbitrarily shaped Fermi surface, and then what do you mean by area? Okay. And so in the ansaldar lifshitz kosevich theory, if you have some weird Fermi surface and you have a magnetic field piercing your sample, then you should look at a plane perpendicular to the magnetic field, which is intersecting your Fermi surface volume, and you look at the external <coughs> areas, either maximal or minimal, because you can have nets and dullies in your Fermi surface. So, yeah, so this is a very well-developed theory of this theory. But I just gave you a childish uh, example of why things are periodic in 1 over h. Okay, 
And you can imagine that if you have oscillations in the density of states, basically all observables, you know, magnetization or transport will show oscillations. So they go by different names. Yes. So in that case, you will get two frequencies, right? Like the one minimum, one maximum. Oh yeah, you can get many, many frequencies because actually uh, you don't necessarily have a single sheeted Fermi surfaces. In complicated materials, you can have many sheets to the Fermi surface and you will get multiple frequencies. So you have to do some for So experiment. you have to actually analyze your data very carefully together with some band calculations usually to figure out exactly what's going on. And you have to change the direction of the field, map out the whole thing. You don't really know where this Fermi surface lives in the Burma zone, but you do know the area. We have a somewhat simpler problem here. It's a 2D problem. Or it's just 3D in the overdose case, but it's got uh, just a corrugated cylinder Fermi surface because it's just very weak hopping along the third direction. Yes. So uh, here I show you simple de Haasler and Alfred data, okay? Unlike what I'm going to show you uh, uh, tomorrow. And so actually, this is because de Haasler and Alfred is in magnetization, but should be called de Haasler. I don't remember which one this is. Is it C axis trans? So this is work of Nigel Hussey's group. And you can see in thallium 2201, you get this very rapid oscillation with a very high frequency. Okay? And high frequency means large Fermi surface. And indeed, by analyzing this Fumian analyzer, if you find the frequency, it is you know, 18 kilotesla, and you get a large integer Fermi surface. And actually, they fit in detail to Lifshitz Kosovich theory temperature dependence, the damping in the field. And they show that it really looks like Fermi liquid quasi particles with an effective mass of just like three or four are consistent with other groups. So I think this really, uh, one thing to note is that for overflow cube rates, there is no conflict, at least qualitatively, between the high temperature zero field experiments like photo emission and the low temperature high field experiments like quantum oscillations. Because there are two ways you could destroy superconductivity. Okay, you could either just zero field raise the temperature of our PC, recover the Fermi surface, or test sees it, or even at low T, you could actually put the high magnetic field, and you've gone from 50 to 60 tesla, which is a very high magnetic field here, uh, in this resolution. Now, this is worth noting because this is in very, very marked contrast to what you will see tomorrow, where there seems to be a qualitative conflict that we really need to understand. We have some ideas about between our best quantum oscillations and under the equipments. Yes? Um, um, for dopings beyond the edge of the dome, Yes. you can do ARP as a, at low temperature without a field. As, so, does that agree with quantum oscillations? So the answer is, so I actually do not know if ARP and quantum mm -hmm. oscillations have been done on the same sample of the same material here. I don't think so, but somebody can correct me. Okay, but, but the more important answer is, a theorist would love to do TC all the way down to zero and go to a non superconducting state. Very often the materials just don't exist there. Like why BCO cannot be overdoped. And sometimes even if materials exist on the very overdoped region like in Lasco, they're quite disordered and you can't do quantum oscillations. So sometimes you have to just live with the best information you have from different materials which looks kind of qualitatively similar and you say this is Yes, yes. A general question about quantum oscillations. Yes. So, others are the area of the Fermi surface. Yes. Is there any way to extract the information about where this Fermi surface lies? Because no, I think you can get the area and you can, excuse me, get the effective masses. But no, where in momentum space they lie, it's hard to get that. Okay. Is there any way you can guess? I, I mean, just from the experiment alone, I think the answer is no. But I'm happy to be corrected by experts who are sitting at the lab. Sorry? Sentence? But I don't think people tech usually do that. I mean, they just use other methods in, in conjunction okay, with these. Yes. Yeah, you, have the background, you have the background specific heat and oscillations on top of that. And you have some information about the multiple signal department. Okay, Oscar, we will discuss that when we come to under Magnetic yes. breakdown orbits could maybe tell you if there are two pockets near each other. Yes. Uh -huh. 
That doesn't say where they are. But they yes, are so you can get that kind of information. And actually, in the underdog of Pinterest, people yeah. have seen that kind of thing. So see, we're it's talking about where those pockets are, nodes or antennas. Hard to do that without additional information. Okay. Just from this single experiment. Right. Okay, very good. Um, actually, can I ask a question? On yes, um, yes. So you started this saying that this is great evidence, it's a Fermi liquid. Yes. Can you be more explicit when you what you require for it to be Fermi liquid versus quasi particles versus, you know? Right. It's so, complicated. so the thing is that. Uh, <clears throat> So there is a very well-developed theory, the lipschitz kosevich theory, which tells you what the frequency should be, what the damping in the field should be, and what the damping with temperature should be. Okay? And the assumption underlying this theory is that you have sharp quasi-particles living at the Fermi surface. And uh, quantum oscillations are predicted, uh, are uh, probing precisely the fertile surface. I mean, you know, it's like really low energy spectrums. Yes? Uh, about the effective mass, is there, because I, if, if I remember correctly, the effective mass can be obtained by temperature dependence. Yes. So, is there any kind of simple theory behind uh, how, uh, the, the, why we can accept this? Yes. Okay. So, lipschitz kosevich theory tells you how to extract M star from the temperature dependence. So, it's, so it's, I would suggest that there's a very good book by Schoenberg. And I don't remember what it's called, but I will tell you. So, look at that for details on all the things, all the information in the world that people have extracted from. Yes. I mean, uh, my question is, yeah. uh, I'm sorry. so, so, uh, my question is, if, if that uh, M-style only works for Fermi liquid, or if this is more general, like, a theorem, like, guarantee that kind of ratio? No, I think uh, the thing is, I don't know of how to derive lipschitz kosevich without assuming sharp quasi particles. M-star is a Fermi liquid concept, right? Mm -hmm. At least... The M star that answers lipschitz kosevich theory is a Fermi liquid. <laughs> okay? Okay. Um, so now let's move from the more conventional metal to what I call the strange metal. Okay? So this is the normal state of the optimally doped superconductor. So chronologically, actually, this was the first thing that was done. Uh, in the years following the discovery. Okay, the stuff I've been discussing has been much, much later, but pedagogically now I'm going here. Okay, so here optimal doping refers to the maximum PC in a given family of superconductors. Over doped means more holes away from this uh, mount insulator. Under doped means less holes, more dangerous territory. So here, how do you determine the boundary? Of of strange metal. Okay, so you so you will yeah. see that. You will see that. We will determine those boundaries. For now, since I don't want to get into determining this boundary at all because it has to do with the pseudo gap, let me just say what if I stick to the normal state at optimality and measure things here. And then we can later on see how much that spreads out there. Okay, so here is a summary of the experiments in the strange metal regime. So the first two points seemingly look uh, uh, conventional. The electronic excitations continue to show a dispersion similar to band theory with some mass renormalization, three, four. And you also get a large Fermi surface with one plus x holes in the strange metal region, which is consistent with the Luttinger. The only thing uh, that uh, probably gives you some feeling that I, there's something else at the back of my mind is because I say similar to and I put Fermi surface in quotation marks. Why do I do that? Because actually, if RPS looks at the line widths, then the spectra are very anomalous and the quasi particles are ill-defined. And I think Dan has some new stuff that he will show us on this purpose. Okay? And the transport, which was the very first thing done, is highly anomalous here. So something is very strange, which is why we don't know what it is. We call it a strange. Excuse me. Yes. When you say quasi particles are ill defined, what do you mean? I'll show you what precisely what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So first the uh, more conventional part of the story. 
Okay, so here I took uh, some data from the Dresden group, showed you the spectral function at omega equals zero. So wherever the intensity lights up tells you what KF is. But, uh, good for me. And then I showed a dispersing band. This is a paper we wrote in really ancient times, which keeps getting referenced than most of my other papers for unknown reasons to me. But it had a dispersion that all uh, theorists love to use and experimentalists love to use. It's a pretty trivial thing. You just put some combination of cosine x plus cosine y through some measured dispersion. And so the dispersion does look uh, pretty ordinary. Okay. So, in fact, it's kind of embarrassing that in 95 year we had one, two, three, four, five measured points through which we to which we fit this five. <laughs> <laughs> it has survived the test of time. Uh, this, uh, this huge amounts of work have been done, and it's fine. Okay, so that looks kind of okay. So, sorry, so these are peaks in R as EDC. That's right. Okay, but now the question was. What did I mean that the quasi-particle was ill-defined? And here is precisely what I mean. By analyzing both the EDCs and the MPCs, and I show you early work, and then I show you new stuff, uh, you can extract the imaginary part of the cell's energy. So let me not precisely go into how you extract that, but what you find is that at fixed temperature, it seems to go linearly in omega, and at very low frequencies at the chemical potential, it seems to go linearly in temperature. Now, I had told you that a quasi-particle should have a line width which is much smaller than its energy or temperature, because then it's well defined. But if the line widths are as large as the frequency or temperature, then I'm in trouble. That's not what I call a quasi-particle. So it's in this sense that the data, so here is Peter Johnson's data, for MPC widths as estimates for imaginary part of sigma, showing that in temperature they show a linear scaling, which it's it's this result that seems to suggest that in the strange metal regime you don't have good quasi particles. Okay, and then that brings us to the original mystery of high TC, which is still not understood. <laughs> Why is the AB plane resistivity in the copper oxide planes a linear function of temperature? And this seems to happen only in near optimality. So I have actually picked out from all of these curves those curves which are near optimality. And look, I can really put this linear pointer on top of these curves. So this is very simple behavior. But we don't understand the other samples. Okay? So, uh, I don't know how much time we have. Maybe I should just go on. Uh, you might want to ask, so, you know, if you look at some conventional uh, metals book, you will say that electron phonon scattering is a linear uh, temperature dependence to uh, resistivities. In fact, platinum is used as a thermometer in the lab because its resistivity is linear in temperature. So, couldn't just this be uh, electron phonon scattering? And there are many reasons not, because that linearity of electron phonon scattering persists only to the Debye temperature or some uh, fraction of it. This linearity persists off and down all the way to 10 Kelvin in certain materials. Also, this shows this very unusual uh, behavior, a violation of the Ophin level mark criterion. There's absolutely no saturation, so Boltzmann transport is totally inapplicable at these high temperatures, the 600 800 Kelvin. Uh, if you were to use Boltzmann transport and to compute the mean free path, the mean free path has become smaller than the uh, lattice spacing. So, um, this is some very unusual uh, regime of transport that, at least at high temperatures, Boltzmann theory doesn't, doesn't, is not valid. Uh, that's completely consistent with the breakdown of quasi particles, and you get this linear resistance. So there's a very early book of C.M. Varma and collaborators, which is a phenomenology which said that, well, there's no other energy scale in the problem like the Fermi energy, like T squared over epsilon Fermi, or T much less than theta divide. The only energy scale seems to be the temperature, and both the single particle and transport scattering rates, one over tau, seem to just be determined by whether you are at high frequency or high temperatures. Uh, excuse me, yeah. uh, what about quench disorder? So quench scale. disorder actually is also a kind of mysterious story because many of these systems 
have a residual resistivity which goes to zero. Okay? Which is very peculiar because quench disorder should have given you residual resistivities at low temperatures. Okay, so what role is quench disorder playing here is also mysterious. Sorry, but it goes to an activity. But uh, suppose you don't, uh, ah. means, suppose you just extrapolate down. You know, if you have a large linear regime to extrapolate, so it just doesn't give you anything, doesn't give you any sizable residual resistivity. You're right, in reality it goes over. Okay, but the microscope, so if, if you take this very seriously, then you find if you have a sigma double prime that goes like omega, it's very easy to show using Kramer's chronic that sigma prime has a log, and the z factor, the quasi particle residue, goes to zero. So this would at least be a way of rationalizing some of the properties uh, that I've talked about. But I think the microscopic origin of this kind of a marginal Fermi liquid phenomenology are unclear at this point. Uh, it seems like only energy scale is T seems to be crying out for a quantum critical point, but it's not clear what quantum critical point would actually do this for us. There's no scaling in Q space, only omega space. So there are many questions and no answers. Sorry, I mean, yes. at sufficiently high temperatures right. for any material, the only energy scale should be T, right? That, that was um, that quantum criticality. So I don't know how. Uh, Okay. Are, you, are you talking about temperatures that have exceeded the bandwidth? Is that, is that kind of temperature you're talking about? Yeah, far in excess of the bandwidth. Yeah, but you know, there are multiple bands at that point in time. And there's no reason why this should have happened in a real material. Uh, in a single band material, okay. If, if in a single band model, if you were to go to sufficiently high temperatures, I agree with the But that's like a non-degenerate regime, right? But this is uh, at least uh, the linear resistivity is very much in a highly degenerate fermionic version. The reason I ask is because too many resistivity is not unique to the cuprates or even materials where there's indications of quantum criticality. So when you say it cries out for a quantum critical point, I was wondering what you meant by that. But maybe that's a okay. So I, as I said, but we don't know whether it is a quantum critical point. Maybe for so some people it cried out for a quantum. Okay, yeah, this is, an, uh, we can discuss it, it's an, uh, I don't know, maybe others have more to add on this, this is kind of an open problem. We can have a discussion, maybe Sintel has something to add on this. Okay, so now we have very little time left, so I, now let me actually turn to the superconductor. Okay, so we've studied uh, the conventional mental estrangement, and now let's look at this. So, with so many strange things going on, maybe a superconductor is also bizarre. So the first thing was gratifying to know that there's pairing going on this. Yeah, that's an experimental state, which uh, it's good to have. So how do we know that? Because we can measure flux quantization. It's a topological object. HC over 2E comes about. Or if you look at the Josephson effect, AC Josephson effect, you get a factor of 2. So that tells you you've got pairing. OK, so the order parameter uh, has to look at the internal pair rate function. So what are, so in spin orbit coupling is weak. So what are spin and orbital quantum numbers? So NMR data shows that the night shift it measures the spin susceptibility goes to zero as you go to zero temperature. Okay, so this is uh, something that you would know from classic textbooks and superconductors that without spin orbit coupling in an S-wave superconductor, the spin susceptibility goes to zero. Doesn't happen uh, under certain circumstances in triple superconductors. So we have similar that. So once you have singlet pairing, then that means that uh, you must have some uh, even parity state. So it could be an S-wave state. And uh, I was certainly young enough to remember that most of the leading lights, barring a uh, few exceptions, and the two exceptions were Dutch Calapino and David Pines, would swear that this material could never be anything but an S-wave superconductor. Okay? And they had reason to say that, uh, but they were all wrong. Uh, it turns out that actually uh, this material is a D-wave superconductor. So uh, in that sense, it's unconventional. The, so D-wave is uh, the technical thing in the travel group. It's B1G symmetry. So by that, I mean that the superconducting order parameter changes sign under a pi by 2 rotation. So the superconductor breaks an additional lattice symmetry in addition to U1 symmetry. 
Okay, so how do we know that? And the answer are the phase sensitive experiments. So actually I've asked Manfred to talk about this because he did some pioneering work in this. So let me just uh, quickly say a little bit. So the initial skepticism that it absolutely could not be anything but an SRA superconductor came because these materials are very robust against disorder. And all the conventional theories say that D-wave superconductors should be highly sensitive to disorder. So we will discuss in a later lecture what the resolution of this is, at least as best understood right now. But anyway, this skepticism is wrong. These are D-wave superconductors, and uh, conventional theories be damned, they are very robust against this one. Okay? And this proof of D-wave pairing came from Joseph's interference. So here I showed Dale Van Hollingen's experiment, where he took a D-wave superconductor by the seal, and he put an S-wave superconductor around it. So you have two Josephson, uh, large Josephson junctions, one here, where a plus lobe faces a plus lobe, and another red one here, where a minus lobe faces a plus lobe. And the standard Josephson equation is I is IC times sine of the phase difference. Here, because a negative lobe faces a positive lobe, you get a high junction. And so as a result, if you don't put any flux here, actually the supercurrent from here and here cancel out, thereby giving you a minimum at zero field. Why isn't that minimum exactly zero? Because the lengths of these two in an experiment can't be made absolutely identical. Uh, the test case has the usual maximum and zero field. So it just tells you that as you turn the corner in the crystal, the phase changes sign. It's an absolutely beautiful experiment. Okay? And uh, this was all of this is discussed in Sigrist and Rice's Reviews of Modern Physics, where they also discuss how if you take a ring of a D-wave superconductor and put a single pi junction, then lo and behold, a half flux quantum should spontaneously be generated. And a more realistic version of this in a triple is done, and lo and behold, the half flux quantum should be generated. Okay? So we, uh, we know that this is a real Now, uh, back to photo emission. Uh, can we measure the superconducting gap? And the answer is yes. So it is. Normal metal, if you have a dispersion epsilon k, the superconductor becomes epsilon squared plus delta squared. And you can see that in the normal metal, the dispersion goes through the chemical potential and the superconductor returns back. Or in the more recent data, you can see it happening all along k space. So at the road, which is along the zone diagonal, the dispersion continues to go through the chemical potential as you go away from the node towards the anti node bends back, bends back at a higher gap, bends back at a still higher gap. And by looking at this, you can measure the gap. And so here is the gap. Uh, actually, the first measurement of the superconducting gap and isotropy from our test showing that the node has zero gap, the antinode has large gap, the second dance PhD thesis, perhaps. Right? Uh, but uh, here is later data showing the full uh, cosine kx minus cosine k by gap by moving along uh, the surface. So this, okay, uh, the fact that the node lies at 45 degrees is also very good evidence for D-wave pairing, but the gap by itself doesn't show the sign change of the order parameter, the broken symmetry that the Josephson interferometry broke. That's why the Josephson interferometry is so important conceptually. However, there is a warning, and uh, as you will see tomorrow, as you underdote the system, away from optimal overdoped regions, there may be strong deviations from the simple D-wave structure. Uh, what about quasi-particles? Now, in the normal state at optimality, they were absent. They were very broad spectral fields. But when you cool through the transition temperature, lo and behold, uh, you get a very sharp resolution-limited quasi-particle peak. And actually, uh, there's been a huge number of experiments, both in photo emission and STM. And the STM, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not describing for time. Uh, maybe Jenny Hoffman is going to be here, so she, I'm sure, will discuss that. Okay, of uh, studying the Bolyabov quasi-particle excitations. Because I have a D-wave gap, it vanishes at four points in the Bergman zone. So actually, I have very low energy excitations that live in the vicinity of those. And those in the vicinity of a node uh, you can write the D-wave dispersion uh, like this for the Bolyabov quasi-particle excitations. So Vf is the dispersion uh, perpendicular to the Fermi surface, and V delta is the dispersion along the Fermi surface. So you get a Dirac cone 
uh, with major and minor axes, which are determined by this Vf and delta. And these are parameters that will then enter into a lot of the low energy physics of the superconducting state. For instance, if you write down the low energy density of states, then it has this absolute value of omega, it's non omega, because the nodes now very familiar from graphene, actually. Uh, but in the denominators, it's this combination VFB. Okay, so I want to basically end with this is the last technical slide. Yes, great. Right. Uh, so, if you can study these nodal quasi particles, and you can using photo emission, as I'll come to, what kinds of properties do they impact? Bulk properties. So, one very important uh, property is the London penetration depth. So, I suppose uh, those of you who know your BCS theory know this formula that 1 over the London penetration depth squared measures the superfluid density Ns. And if you look at the temperature dependence of the superfluid density, then it has a zero temperature uh, uh, value, and then it decreases from that zero temperature value linearly in temperature, and that linear temperature dependence of the low temperature uh, superfluid density is really uh, looking at the presence of nodes. Because if you had a fully gapped superconductor, then the superfluid density would be degraded only by creating normal fluids, and normal fluid excitations would have to be excited across a gap. So there would be an exponential suppression of that, so you would have a much flatter. The reason why you get this linear temperature dependence, very crudely speaking, is the density of states for making uh, low energy excitations goes linearly in the energy and therefore linearly in the temperature at a hand waving level, and that's what gives you this linear temperature. Sorry, uh, yes. is that lambda minus 2? Yes, 1 over lambda squared. Oh, I mean the plot. The plot is also the superfluid density, which is 1 over lambda squared. Okay. So the superfluid density is large at low temperatures, or the London penetration depth, therefore, is small. And then, of course, when you hit the transition, the field penetrates everywhere. So London penetration depth diverges with superfluid density goes to zero. So there is uh, another very beautiful quantity, which in some sense uh, has some universal aspects. And I really recommend this ERB article of Adam Durst and Patrick Lee to you, uh, where they discuss uh, the universal transport, which is independent of impurities, as measured by the thermal conductivity. And uh, what they showed, and here is measurements of the type group, that if you measure the electronic thermal conductivity, then it has this very beautiful form, which is completely universal with only Vf and V delta into it. Ah, so quiz to the students. Okay. So if I had an S wave superconductor, we all know that it is a superconductor of electricity. Okay. What does it do to heat transport? In an S wave superconductor, what does heat transport? Yeah? Let's say it's exponentially activated. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a thermal insulator electronically. Okay? Why is the superconductor a thermal? I'm not talking about phonon thermal transport, transport an electronic. So why is the superconductor a thermal insulator? An S wave superconductor at low temperatures? Gap. gap, but you know, the gap didn't prevent the electrons from conducting charge, so that can be the answer, right? Because you might have thought, oh, the electrons are gapped, this would be an insulator, like all other, what kicks in and conducts, gives you superconductivity, to condensate. So, gap be damned, right? So, what about heat transport? Why is it thermal insulator? Well, the, the Cooper pairs of the condensate are charged objects, yes. and they're low energy objects. So why can't they carry heat? They have a charge 2 e; they can move. move this I know. They don't carry entropy. Because they carry no entropy. That's the point. You see, the condensate is such an ordered state of matter it cannot carry entropy. So superconductor is a thermal issue. Okay. And so the only thing that gives you thermal conductivity in a superconductor are quasi-particle excitations, electronic thermal. And now how many quasi-particle excitations do you generate? 
you generate quasi particle excitations proportional to temperature. Okay, and that's where the thermal conductivity is proportional to the temperature. Now the independence of impurities, maybe it's too late, but it's actually a very beautiful story that is for any one of you who is interested in low temperature transport and superconductors, you should know the story. Okay? In any case, here is uh, uh, Louis Taifer's data where he measures kappa over t on the, the y-axis versus t squared. The reason to plot it like this is because the intercept gives you um, electronic thermal conductivity, right? Because a linear part, and the slope gives you a T cube thermal conductivity, which is the flow non contribution. So this you can make. So here he's showing that you get this. Uh, you can understand this. Sorry, how's that zero intercept possible? Okay, because this is six point zero. This is the Mott incident. Ah. It has no electron. Sorry, just yes. one question. Yes. Uh, you said S-wave superconductor is thermal uh, insulator right. without other... So the thing is, of course, thermal conductivity in S-wave superconductors is exponentially suppressed. Whereas in D-wave superconductors, it's only linearly suppressed. That's it. So the question is, what is kappa? In a D-wave superconductor, kappa is proportional to temperature. And because that's the number of particle excitations you can make. In S-wave superconductor, kappa would be proportional to E to the minus gap over Okay, so at this point you can ask me, well, uh, so you've shown me all this beautiful stuff with VF and Vita and stuff, why don't you tell me what ArtPest says about this? So I'm going to withhold that information. And the reason is because it takes me into dangerous territory. Because what one should really like to do is look at the doping dependence of superconducting state parameters. What does the gap and isotropy do? What does the maximum gap and the antinode do? What do VF and V delta do? And all of these have rather non-trivial answers as a function of underdoping, and answers which have been changing as a function of time. As the technique has improved, we understand why they have changed also as a function of time. Okay? And they also possibly have something to do with pseudo gap physics. So that's why I will withhold the answer for now. Okay, very good. So I have covered in my one and a half hours all of this. Hopefully not at the cost of exhausting you. Uh, and I will cover this. So in pictures, what have I told you today? I told you about hydrogen pseudoconductors. I told you that the parent insulating compound is a moth insulator. The strongly overdoped uh, at large hole doping region is a Fermi liquid. The region here is a strange metal with a Fermi surface but no quasi particles and enormous transport. And down here I have a superconductor with uh, dx squared minus y squared singlet pairs and sharp global quasi particles, uh, whose manifestation is seen in many different uh, experiments. And tomorrow, be ready for much more, more detailed pursuit. Thank you. The superconductivity on the overdoped side that condenses out of what seems to be a Fermi liquid, does that have BCS like phenomenology? It does to some extent. For instance, PC is going up as you change doping. The energy gap is also going up as you change doping. Even that is no longer true. What about the specific heat jump? So the specific heat jump, okay, so I haven't looked at the overdose data in a long time. I can look at it and get back to you. Measuring the electronic specific heat in a superconductor at several hundred Kelvin or 100 Kelvin is not an easy. There's a large phonon diagram in which there's one group for John Laura at Cambridge who did spectacular experiments about 15 years ago. And I should look at that and tell you whether on the overdose side it looks more Conventional. Does anyone remember? Yeah. yeah. It does? It, does. it probably does. does. Except it's got a height associated with the e wave gap now. Sure. And then it's just a kind of sort Yeah, so I should push. I have to give you the reference. Yes, Leo. How well known is what, uh, what happens to the lines on the bill? Like, uh, how quickly the endocrinetic uh, noise is in here? Quite murky, in my opinion, because I think disorder and other effects. Uh, well, if you go disorder, 
But in the experiment you can't. Oh, in theory. Yeah, you are Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, there are all these very beautiful ideas of Sherman and Sijira and so on. But I don't think any of them have ever been seen very much in the experiments. I don't have a comment on the theory. Uh, maybe somebody has <coughs> said that you have a comment on theory of the very likely book model theory. <laughs> yeah. So, so actually, uh, experimentally, there's some, uh, there's a slide that I hid, uh, which is done. I don't know whether you were involved in that, but there are a bunch of works from ZX Shen's group of looking at the oxychlorides, mm -hmm. and that's also very interesting. Like, what does the spectral function of a single hole doped inside a Mott insulator look like, and so on? And I don't know if that's also fully understood. The party line is that some strong electron phonon coupling destroys the quasi particle there. I don't know whether I necessarily buy that party line, even though I'm on record as saying that. But there's beautiful data there. Okay, you've got no more questions. Thank you for coffee. Okay, thank you.